Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. This is my, my first time. Um, and I can't imagine, I mean, I'm not a massively religious person, but if I could <laughs> kind of <laughs> describe this place as anything, it would probably be divine. And I think you've set the bar really high now, so every conference from here after needs to be in a place like this. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so without further ado, I introduce you to my paper. It's called The Howl of the Wolf Tone, Void Harmonics and Occultizing Entropy. Okay, so there are three quotes um, on the screen that I'm going to use to frame um, my discussion. Um, Allure is a special and intermittent experience in which the intimate bond between a thing's unity and its plurality of notes somehow partially disintegrates. Next one down. Black metal is beyond music. It exceeds its function of musical genre. It radiates its sepulchral fire on every side of culture. Black metal is a suffering body that illustrates in the same spring all of human darkness as much as its vital impetus. And then lastly, the void, of course, is a period of emptiness as the moon completes its final aspect with any planet in the sign it is passing through and ends the moment the moon aspects a new sign. Some believe that working magic during this time will yield at best no results and at worst chaotic and unpredictable results. These three quotes help to focus us on the primer materia of this paper. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> How the liminal sonic quality of the wolf tone's fragmenting allure informs the role of the abyss in black metal composition and performance that in turn speaks to the emptiness and chaotic craft of the void of course moon. The alchemy of these three strands forges a spring of putrefaction, the negredo, as the final art object for occultizing entropic black metal. To begin, let us examine the wolf tone. Wolf tones uh, tend to be characterised as unwanted octaval pulsing resonances uh, in orchestral music that tend to be found on stringed instruments. There is a considerable literature on how to avoid or get rid of them, even equipment that has been created to eliminate them from performances and recordings. Allure and the plurality of notes caused by wolf tones obscure the designated not notation from being heard in a pure form as these accidental harmonics cry across E-flats and G-sharps, screaming and lamenting over the purposeful and desired notes. It is this undesired liminality of sonorous wailing that imposes itself upon the intended, and historically, the wolf tone has been treated by the Western musical canon in much the same way as semitones, or the tritone, or diabolus in musica, um, has become an aberration, uh, Niall Scott would call it ap apophatic liturgy. Uh, it's an insult to God, but it's always unwanted. So let's have a listen to what a wolf tone sounds like. So let me see if I get this right. <coughs> See, as you can see here, it's, it's finding and fixing the wolf tone. It's, it's never just, what is the wolf tone? Let's enjoy the wolf tone. It's like, get rid of it. I hear it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Many cellos have something that's called a wolf tone. Some violins have it as well. This cello I have here has a particularly bad one. <laughs> to find the wolf tone, you're going to start on the G and slide up the string until you find a hideous wobbling pitch. It will be quite obvious when you hit it. I think that's amazing. Yes. Why, would you, why would you want to get rid of something that just sounds so otherworldly? It's extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's just uh, just bear with me. Let me just go back. Okay. Now. <laughs> okay. So it's a <laughs> an uh, an unwanted harmonic wobble, an unnecessary vibrato, an irritating tremolo that shouldn't be there, 
A cursory search on YouTube uh, shows mostly videos about identifying the wolf tones and their elimination. Obviously, with orchestral music, the emphasis on form, function and abeyance to the score takes precedence, and anything considered outside of this remit must fall within sanctioned avant-garde compositions um, found with the likes of Schoenberg or Penderecki or Stockhausen. But the wolf tone is always restrained, eliminated, controlled at all times. It's never allowed to just exist as is. I want to take Schoenberg's notion of emancipated dissonance and instead of applying it to semitones and dodecaphonics, I apply it to the wolf tone. His idea that how the music sounds is not the point. I'm just going to say that again because I love that because he was such a stroppy individual, but it's wonderful. How the music sounds is not the point. Directs us to the process rather than the end result. The wolf tone is the epitome of that process, the crucible in which the sonics form. Yet it is the shadow of the thing desired the objectal penumbra of the subject that haunts the sonic space through which the abyss takes form. It is the gloom of becoming, the shade cast by the subject in process, the mist that obfuscates finality. In this voidic vessel, the chaotic energies of the wolf tone rhizomatically grow and feed on the prima materia, liberating themselves from canonical loathing and find new ontologies in black metal. <laughs> I felt like I was almost giving a sermon then. That was <laughs> <laughs> so if we can take the categorization of the wolf tone as the vibrational representation of the abyss, then I argue that black metal is what the abyss sounds like. Yeah. It is the anti-human manifesto that actively seeks access to the void through composition and performance. So I'm going to play you an early example of the second wave, or according to Hunter Hunt Hendricks, the Hyperborean um, wave um, black metal band <laughs> called uh, Mayhem. Their demo Death Crush from 1987 not only showcases avant-garde sound manipulation techniques in its drum-based intro called, excuse my terrible German pronunciation, Sylvester Anfang. If anybody wants to correct me, then please go ahead. Uh, but this was actually created for the band uh, by the German electronic composer and early Tangerine Dream member, Konrad, Sch Konrad Schnitzler. Um, but the vocal delivery of the first track proper, called Death Crush, through the use of reverb, you can hear the vocals are completely wrapped in wolf tones. So let's have a, let's have a little listen. any of their music because it's, it's far too totally pleasant. Interestingly, Schmitzler didn't really compose it for the band. Um, a band member basically camped outside of his house until he gave them something to go away. This is the beginning of the first track proper. Okay. So 
the, re the reverb actually foregrounds the vocal harmonic wolf tones exponentially, adding an otherworldly occultizing rendering that connects not only with the otherness of black metal, but also that of the avant-garde and the wolf tone. So let me just go back. Okay. Uh, wolf tones are also present in the guitar work. Uh, the now orthodox expectation of tremolo, tremolo picking or speed picking um, in black metal guitars uh, often accompanied often accompanied by blast beats on the drums at about 300 to 400 BPM um, and above, gives the impression of sonics in perpetuity. No articulated figures, no beginnings, no pauses, no dynamic range. Hunt Hendrick suggests that it's a continuous open strumming and a continuous blast beat is eternity itself. The tremolo picking often holds over octaval chordal structures that incorporate elements of minimalism, such as melodic ostinati, phasing, conjunctive motifs, polyrhythms, alongside dyadic and successive counterpoint. Uh, this guitar technique offers tangible echoes of transcendentalism, movement in stasis, of flux, whilst being caught in seemingly stationary bars of the composition. Iowa Garden talk characterise tremolo picking as a fast pulsation characterising the diffusions of a sustained sound in the form of mul multiple repetitions articulated in discontinuous frequencies. In other words, you get your plectrum, you, go, you hold a chord, and you do that. Okay. <laughs> A static space is held in place by its perpetuity that oscillates between the vibrato of the wolf tones offered up by the tremolo guitar work and of the wolf tones that howl through the reverb of the vocals. The dissonance created by these minimalist compositional techniques of tremolo and screaming, the wolf tones that cry from their quick vibrations, burst to the bloom of black metal's subjective transformation. Other early examples that also celebrate the existence of the wolf tone in their recordings are Dark Throne, particularly the drone introduction to Catharian life code from A Blaze in the Northern Sky, some Burzum, but you have to struggle quite hard to look through the racism to find the good bits of uh, the, <laughs> uh, the same name, and contemporary examples of black metals such as the introduction to Denigratus Missa De Functorum, Requiem Mass in A minor. Interestingly, it's very often the intro to these albums that contain the clear sonic signifiers of otherness of auditory nomadic metamorphoses that undulate and flow within the recordings rather than a sound engineer agreeing to remove them. Hmm. Black metal embraces the otherness of the wolf tone into its own otherness of being, its entropic allure, rather than operating as a subtracting element, it offers up its own voidic timbres to the altar of black metal. And what of the void? If we understand or assume it to be dark, to be black, that its nothingness signifies otherness, that the abyss, at least in part, can be recognised as emptiness, then the black in black metal is the abyssic home of the wolf tone, of reverb and echoes, of dark sonic vistas roiling against themselves. And it is exactly this otherness of black metal that we find its secret knowledge. Uh, Eugene Thacker suggests, the black in black metal is its references to black magic, demons, witchcraft, lycanthropy, necromancy, the nature of evil, and all things dark and funereal. The association of black metal to Satanism and a figure of the devil, it would seem that this equation is the defining factor of black metal. Black equals Satanism. The black in black metal is the negredo in formation, the alchemical dark shadow of the metal um, of metal as a subgenre and to popular music writ large. In black metal, the howl of the wolf tone and its voidic harmonics are welcomed and cradled in the arms of the rotting corpse of disintegration, of black metal performers as corpses in corpse paint, screaming the abyss and howling their wolf tones. As Joseph H. Peterson translates in the Grimorium Verum, Beelzebub sometimes appears in monstrous forms, such as the shape of a monstrous calf or a billy goat with a long tail. When angry, he vomits flames and howls like a wolf. Without getting sidetracked into black metal and Satanism, and for those of you that do want to get sidetracked by that, please have a look at black metal theory. Um, <laughs> what is of value here is the link between black metal and the occult, that the abyss that gives birth to one also gives birth to the other. The mother of abominations fecundity means that the crucible is the womb. 
the harmonic relations between wolf tones, black metal and the occult signifies that through emptiness, otherness can become form. Voidic harmonics and all harmonic proportions have a long-standing history from Pythagoras to Kepler to Eliphas Levi. One I particularly like is that of Pythagoras, who, using the terms of music, called the interval <coughs> between the earth and the moon a tone. The so-called music of the spheres, as, as was spoken of this morning, um, linked early music theory to the sounds of the universe. According to Sterling, the assertion that the planets and their revolutions round the earth uttered certain sounds differing according to their respective amplitude, celerity and local distance were commonly made by the Greeks. Thus Saturn, the farthest planet, was said to give the gravest note, whilst the moon, which was the nearest, gave us the sharpest. Pliny says, Saturn moveth with the Doric tone, Mercury by Thongus, Jupiter by Phrygian, and the rest likewise. The names of the Greek scales or modes for the most part remain unchanged in music theory. Of course, that we also know that the planets have their own sounds. Let's have a little listen. It's, it's the last sound clip, so I don't have to keep fucking about with this every five minutes. <laughs> okay. Really is wonderful. NASA are accredited, you see? It's all good. <laughs> the universe actually does, uh, they were right, it does have its, does have their, uh, its own sound. And Thacker explores this um, in his essay called Sounds of the Abyss. And he states, whilst NASA reports make no occult claims, <laughs> it's shame, really. <laughs> it remains interesting because it hints at the theme that, I, that is, I think, at the centre of extreme music genres today, and that is the relationship between sound and negation. We commonly think of the relation between sound and negation as the negation of sound. And this in turn relies on the well-worn dichotomy of sound and silence. We can take a different approach and ask, can music or sound itself be a negation? In, in a way, uh, this is what black metal genres do, presenting us with forms of negation that are coextensive with music and sound. The idea of music, sound, silence and negation are ideas that ring out in parallel with the history of avant-garde composition from Pierre Schaeffer's Musique Concrète to Stockhausen's Contactor. Maybe Mayhem asked Schnitzler to compose for them is wonderfully fitting. Scott Wilson's notion of black metal as the buzzing of life without being, accurately quoting the magazine Terrorizer stating, true cavaltists like their black metal to sound like bees in a tin. That is actually true, that is accurate. <laughs> All attempt to illustrate the sonic, uh, sonic and philosophical nexus and relationship between these ideas. The occultizing entropic harmonies of the wolf tones and black metal, the universe crafting, as Graham Harmon states, its black noise, its bees in a tin, its unsound, show us that its negation is its subject in process. And it is definitely not the ambience of composers such as Brian Eno. It is not audio wallpaper or music for airports. It is too auditorily grinding for that. However, I would add that ambient, in the sense that Eno meant it, was not really a genre at all, but a mode of listening. The otherworldliness of black metal, I argue, also encourages this mode of listening that is nomadic, that is transfiguration and reconstitution, and, and perhaps ultimately blackening. This other sonic engagement also speaks to the desire to step away from the ravages of society and of humanity. The anti-human manifesto of sorts um, of black metal that can be found on the inlay of Mayhem's Dawn of the Black Hearts album shares aspects with Peter Gray's apocalyptic witchcraft. Uh, Gray states, We must reject the values of our culture and actively oppose them with the visions we garner from dreaming. But this is also a critique of those witches who simply think that it's a matter of listening to which style music wearing which style clothes and thereby achieving nothing at all. It does not matter if you listen to black metal or Bach, or both, 
<laughs> the proof of witchcraft is the rejection of the values of this culture and the actions that you then take. Similarly, Euronymous from Mayhem's st statement, you can get through it without laughing too much, um, reads similarly. I'm going to read you all of it. Um, we have no vocalist anymore. Dead killed himself uh, two weeks ago. It was really brutal. Uh, first he cut open all of his uh, ve on, re veins on his wrist and then he blow off his, uh, his brain with a shotgun. I found him and it looked fucking grim. The upper half of his head, you can see it, they actually used it as their album cover. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the upper half of his head was all over the room and the lower part of the brain had fallen out on um, of his, the rest of his head and down onto the bed. I, of course, grabbed the camera immediately, didn't mean the police, I grabbed the camera immediately and made some photos and we'll use them for the next Mayhem CD. I and Hellhammer were so lucky that we found the two pieces of his skull and we have hung them on necklaces as a memory. Dead killed himself because he lived only to the old true black metal scene and lifestyle. It means black clothes, spikes, crosses and so on. You know, bands like the old Hellhammer, Bathory and so on. But today there are only children in jogging suits and skateboards and hardcore moral ideals. <laughs> they are to look as normal as possible. This has nothing to do with, with black. This stupid people must fear black metal. But instead they love shitty bands like Deicide, Benediction, Napalm, Death, Sepultura and all that shit. We must, <laughs> I thought they were quite good. <laughs> we must take this scene for, for what it was in the past. Dead died for this cause and now I have declared war. I'm angry, but at the same time I have to admit that it was interesting to be able to examine a human brain in rigor mortis. <laughs> death to false black metal and death metal, also to trend trendier hardcore people. Arg. Okay, so I wasn't literally reading that's so why I had to read it very slowly. Okay. So the second and third paragraphs are of particular interest in their correlation to Gray's statement. Of course, this information is also subject to Euronymous's historical revisionism, but the general anti-human or certainly anti-culture ethos is clear. Others, such as Walls in the Throne Room, have also stated similar sentiments. In Timothy Morton's essay, At the Edge of the Smoking Pool of Death, he quotes the band as saying, one of the many contradictions of black metal is that it is a music that decries civilization, but relies on so many modern controversies to exist. I don't think it is a natural sound at all. It is really a sound of paradox, ambiguity, confusion, being caught between two worlds that cannot be reconciled. I've had people throw this in my face before. How can you play music that is supposedly anti-civilization on electric guitars? Frankly, I find this line of reasoning boring and pointless. The negation of what is through the sonic negation of black metal is the paradox, the two worlds that are in antagonistic stasis, emptiness, the abyss, the final aspect. And it is this final aspect that brings my paper full circle to the void of course, the period of emptiness as the moon completes its final aspect with any planet in the sign it is passing through and ends the moment the moon aspects the new sign. The liminal space of the nomadic transference, not in one sign nor another, a space of em emptiness, a void. Donna Woodwell suggests, the void of course moon um, are marked on astrological calendars for a reason. If you have a magical bone in your body, you'll want to pay attention. Since the planet's light um, is what uh, gives divine oomphiness to creation, a void moon is akin to a celestial lacuna, a trough between the waves of the cosmic ocean. In a sense, void moons are like the moon's equivalent of a retrograde, of course, the moons don't actually have that because it'd be a bad thing for earthlings if they did. <laughs> but it carries a similar tone. One of nature's built-in times for reflection and consideration. Void moons are not the time necessary to create potent magic because of this gap. However, it is the perfect time to do deep work instead precisely because of this gap. Woodwell suggests... Um, void moons are also amazing times to commune with the deep forces of the psyche. Energies turn inwards towards the movements of soul and spirit. We meditate, float, or just sleep and rejuvenate. This inward turning from our exteriorities to our interiorities is vital for black metal composition because we must know ourselves and be brave enough to face it if we are to commune with black metal, either as a fan or as a performer. Composing or performing black metal during void moon facilitates the abyssic nature of the wolf tone as its disintegrative properties fragment out into the void as the void of course moon.
creating a deep reflective art form that is the closest thing that they can be to the sound of the abyss. I do this. <laughs> I compose black metal during void moons and wolf tones emanate from my guitars and my screams. I am a witch and I am a witch crafting. In Grey's Apocalyptic Witchcraft, its manifesto states that witchcraft is the art of inversion. It is the revolution and the power of woman. To say that I felt this <laughs> in my bones is a bit romantic, but it has a real resonance. A spiritual path forged through my performance in my band Dena Grata have brought me to this point. Grey adds, witchcraft is the recourse of the dispossessed, the powerless, the hungry and the abused. It gives heart and tongue to stones and trees. If we take the moon in her third house as goddess, then composing black metal during a void moon is not only the embodiment of the other, it is feminist work. It is a nomadic deterritorialising of hegemonic femininity, of black metal's masculine frame, and has found a home with the most patriarchally hated of folkloric female figures represented by and through Denigrata. In Denigrata's video for Kyria Lazon, myself and Menea, the other woman in the band, both appear as glitches and clipped images, is the visual representation of black noise, the camera only resting on us for a few seconds before cutting to a different shot. This adds to the transient nature of us as witches existing on the edge of the void. As Grey notes, thriving in this liminal, lunar, trackless realm, we emerge from the water at the end of the video, which could be said to represent the inverted baptismal embodiment, because not only the, wa the water represents a liminal moving body, but it is also us emerging from its waters, not us being immersed into it. Throughout all of Denigrata's perichoresis, Hunt Hendricks, we also are crossing the borders between noise and silence, fluidity and stasis, life and death. Interestingly, there is a, a polysemia uh, to Denigrata herself as being perceived as a witch at all. Brenda Gardner-Walter, an academic who also writes for Dirge magazine, read an article entitled Goring the Stag, the Satanic Antlered Priestess, in which she compared Denigrata herself's role and appearance with Kay Walsh, the protagonist from Hammer horror film The Witches. She writes... In the scrotophilic musical subculture of satanic black metal, Denigrata herself claims female authority. Performing as an antlered priestess, she gives voice to the feminine abyss. She is not a plaything for male desire, not a groupie or a girlfriend. Neither is she a witch at her cauldron in the forest, waiting in puerile, puerile obedience for the arrival of Baphomet or Beelzebub. Instead, she is herself the sacred stag, the great horned god, the ruler of the night. It is she who commands the ceremony and begins the dark dance. In any way that my black metal performance is decoded, my screams celebrate the void harmonics and otherness of the wolf tone. My guitar techniques facilitate the howling vibrato. These sonic negations belong in black metal and emanate from the abyss. To compose during a void moon elevates the deep work being done. The howl of the wolf tone as occult occultizing entropy in black metal is the feminist subject as abyss in process. Thank you very much. Woo! All right. Yes.